Hey man, that was that was tough. <laughs> Not only that, but how many people do you know that can play a drum and direct and sing all at the same time? You know? <laughs> Thank you, God, for all the gifts. I invite you to uh, to turn in your Bible. Uh, you can open up to the book of Proverbs, even though those are both kind of one verses and uh, one verse scriptures. I'll pop them up on the screen here. Uh, the, the scripture from Hebrews is a little bit longer if you want to go ahead and mark that one, and I will come to those in just a few moments. Um, if you would, uh, we, uh, I invite you into this time of listening for God's word. Uh, we are uh, kind of at the tail end of a worship series uh, called It Takes a Village and talking about all the ways that we are trying to raise these young lives, and it's something that's not just for those who are in the season of parenting right now, but, but all of us as the church have been given this responsibility. So these are important things uh, to talk about, and I know that today you're going to get something good out of it no matter what season and stage of life you're in. So I invite you into a, a moment of prayer with me, and uh, inviting God into us uh, together. Let's all pray. Oh God, we come to this place. We gather in this room as a community, as a family, as a village that has been tasked with being your community, with being your kingdom where you reign and where you rule and where you have your way. 
And so God, build into us right now those blocks, those bricks of your being. God, speak into us words of life, words that that bring hope and meaning to our lives. God, fill the gaps within us that we could be full of that life and presence and goodness of you. Help us to hear your voice and convict us so that we could be sent out to be more like you. God, make us ready for the calling that you have given us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, as your village and all of God's people said, amen, amen. So we're going to start with a bit of uh, participation today. So if you know it, just help me out. Spare the rod and y'all are good. Y'all are awesome. Anybody know, anybody know where we can find that in the Bible? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was actually a trick question. Trick question. That is not actually in the Bible. You won't be able to find it. It is not there. The closest thing that somebody might point to is our first scripture this morning, Proverbs 13, verse 24, which reads like this. It says, whoever spares the rod hates their children. But the one who loves their their children is careful to discipline them. There's nothing there about spoiling a child. And that that oh-so-familiar phrase actually comes and begins with a 17th century poem by Samuel Butler called Hudibras. Nevertheless, though, the Bible does have quite a bit to say about discipline. I like the way that the message translates Proverbs 13, 24. The message translation says this. It says, a refusal to correct is a refusal to love. Love your children. Love them by disciplining them. Proverbs 19, 18 says this. It says, discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. And then I invite you to read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11 with me. Hebrews here is speaking about God's discipline of all of God's people. And it says this, it says, And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when God rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one that he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son or daughter. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God, God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in God's holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Edward, the Duke of Windsor, once quoted, he said this, he said, The thing that impresses me the most about America is the way the parents obey their children. Some of us catch that a little in a minute, yeah. The way the parents obey their children. I I agree that that this is one of the major problems in our country and in our culture. It's that we, we have neglected our children. We've neglected this calling uh, of discipline them, and, and I think uh, that a lot of it comes because we are overly captured by our cell phones. We're captured by our cell phones and we neglect that, that continually present, that, that, that intentional parenting and discipline. But according to Scripture, according to the Bible, discipline is critically important. 
Because according to these texts that we just read, it guides our children. It guides them into who they're supposed to be. It it keeps them off of those wrong and harmful paths. It, It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. It brings life and it brings hope to their future because it forms them into who they are created to be. My friends, we all need discipline. But the million dollar question, the one that will get me in trouble, is this. How? How do we discipline? I mean, do we really need a rod? Somebody, anybody, please tell me what's right because, you know what, these these little ones did not come with an owner's manual, amen? Amen. And to be perfectly honest with you, to be totally transparent this morning, I, I, some of the discipline in the Bible gets a, a, a little bit scary, doesn't it? Like, like Genesis chapter 7 where, where the earth is flooded because of people's rampant wickedness or Genesis chapter 19 where, where burning sulfur is rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sinfulness or Numbers 16 where the earth splits open and literally swallows up these rebellious Israelites. I mean, if this is God's discipline, then we all... We all have good reason to be afraid because we are all sinful. And my friends, that that theology may work for many folks and and it is scripturally justifiable. But but I'd like to wrestle with it just a little bit today. So, So hang with me, hang with me a little bit because personally... Personally, I have a difficult time reconciling these ideas of of punishing discipline with a God who is wholly good, with a God who's who's not just about loving, but, but who, according to Scripture, is love. You know, when I was when I was much smaller, I know y'all didn't think I could get much smaller. Short people power. (laughs) <laughs> but when I, was, when I was much smaller, I remember a time when my mom was disciplining me for something. And, and honestly, I can't remember what it was that I had done. I, I honestly cannot even remember what the, what the uh, punishment was, how I was being disciplined at the time. All I can remember was that I was fire-spitting mad at my mom. I thought that this was totally unjust, totally unwarranted. I was angry that I was being treated this way. How could she do this to me? And so I decided in my young, great mind at the time, I decided that I was going to run away from home. That'll teach her, won't it? I packed up a suitcase and I I snuck it quietly out of the house and then I stood there on our front porch finally free. And I kept standing there on the front porch. You know, I I hadn't totally thought this all the way through yet. And I I think that I probably stood on that front porch for about 25 minutes or so, almost hoping that somebody would come out and discover me there, you know. But nobody ever did. And so I finally lugged that suitcase back into the house. I tossed it back in my room and I marched straight to my mom. I said to her, you know what? What? You can run away from home. (laughs) That's right, Mom. You can run away from home. I'm going to stay here with Dad. But but you you know what, actually? But when Dad was working, you could come back and take care of me. So there, that's my final offer. And and as, that that is a true story, 100%. But as I've, as I've thought back on that incident, it's, it's reminded me of how we read discipline through different lenses. Depending on which party we are in the disciplining, we, we read it and we view it and we see it differently. I, I, know, I know that my mom was not trying to hurt me, not trying to, to harm me with her discipline. She was actually trying to love me. And as Hebrews compares the discipline of our parents to the the discipline of God, I wonder if our God would not be the same. To where 
God wasn't disciplining out of anger and, and punishment and, and retribution, but God who is perfect, God who is long-suffering, God who holds those fruits of the Spirit such as self-control, that that God was always disciplining out of love and formation. After all, those verses from Proverbs, they, they speak about discipline being an act of love. About discipline being something that, that builds life and builds hope into the young ones that receive it. But of course, when we're on the receiving side of that discipline, it probably doesn't feel much like love. Hebrews says, says very plainly, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. It seems painful, amen? You know, over the last few weeks, we've had um, some wonderful workshops uh, on life hacks parenting. If you have missed them, you definitely want to mark February 13th for the, the very last one on your calendar and show up. But one thing I wanted to share this morning that Kristen Page, our new minister to children and families, said, she said this past week, she said this, she said, discipline is not something we do to our children. It's something we're striving to develop in our children. Now, my possibly very bad interpretation of that is this. Discipline is not punishment that we do to our children. No, discipline is a formative process where we work towards a developmental goal. We work towards shaping these young lives. We work towards forming something good and better within them. In other words, discipline and punishment are two different things. They're not the same. And I think that that's what Hebrews is pointing you and me towards when it says, endure hardship as discipline. Don't endure hardship as punishment, but endure it as discipline, as training. Because discipline is a training. It's kind of like the image of an athlete you know, when I was training for a marathon, discipline was critical. I, I, I had to, I had to get up at 4.30 in the morning and run eight miles at least three times a week if I was ever going to be able to run 26.2 miles without stopping. Now, some of y'all, y'all may see that as punishment, amen? But it's discipline, not punishment, it's for an end goal of making me better, of making me stronger. It's, it's not for the goal of harming me and causing pain unnecessarily. It's for the goal of forming me into what I need to be. And, and I believe that that is God's way as well. Now, I'm getting into theology here, so if you disagree, that's okay. No problem. But when I read the whole of Scripture, when I read the entirety of the Bible I don't think that God punishes out of anger. I don't think that God is punitive like most of our criminal justice system is punitive. Instead, I believe that our God is redemptive. I believe that God is, is working to redeem, working to bring something better, working within us to make us more than we are right now. I believe that God trains us for righteousness and trains us for peace and trains us for hope and trains us for life. And so going back to that, that very first thing, going back to that rod thing, right? Whoever spares the rod hates their children, says Proverbs. But y'all know Y'all know that the shepherd's rod, the good shepherd's rod, is not a beating stick, right? It's a guiding staff. In the 23rd Psalm, it says, Thy rod and thy staff, they don't scare me. They what? They comfort me. They comfort me because they're implements of protection. They're implements of keeping me alive. They're implements of making me into my best self. So my friends, as we strive to live Christ, to be more authentically like God, that image of God that is within us that we see revealed in Scripture as well, here are some things to remember. Three things. First of all, most importantly, discipline should always, 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 always be done in love. Second of all, discipline 
Discipline is not something we do to children. It's how we work to develop something within our children. You see, anger, anger is me-centered. It's about what I need to make me feel better. So discipline out of anger is not godly, it is abuse. Anger is me-centered, but discipline is you-centered. It's about what's best for you. Ephesians 4, 26 says this. It says, in your anger, don't sin. Finally, the third thing is this. Training a child is not a hundred-yard dash. It's a marathon. It's a marathon of daily training. Things don't change in one incident or in one moment. Things don't change quickly. And, and you and I, we are going to make mistakes along the way. In fact, we have probably already made mistakes along the way. But here's the good news. Our God is good. Our God continues to work both within us and within our children. And God can cover wherever we go wrong. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the blessing of holy young lives. For these little eyes that look at the world with such innocence that see goodness and yet who still need that formation into what you are calling them to be. God, help us to be those channels like the, like the banks of a river to guide them to the right places. Help us to have wisdom and patience in all that we do. Help us to speak those words of love that can bring change, especially when all the children have heard is anger and hate. God, use us to be like you, to be full of forgiveness and grace and hope and love. Help the young lives that are in this place and beyond these walls to become what you want them to be and use us for that work. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, amen. Yahtzee! Hey, this Wednesday is a first Wednesday. So we're going to begin the First Wednesday Fellowship. If you are one of our chronologically enhanced members, you're invited to come this Wednesday at 11.30. We are going to have a meal of soup and cornbread and other good stuff prepared. And afterwards, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask our pastors Ronnie and Pastor me any questions that you might have about the church or being a minister, anything that you would like to know. After that, we'll have some fun games to share together. And so I hope that you will join us for a good time. And I'm not the Uno one. Hey, Sean, what are you doing? You know, I'm getting warmed up. But this would be a whole lot more fun with the bouncy house. But that's okay, because this Wednesday, we're gonna have a bouncy house. We're gonna have lots of fun games, and we're gonna have ice cream sundaes with all sorts of great toppings. And all the families of the church are invited to come out and meet our brand new minister to children and families, Kristen Page. Come get the inside scoop on her. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. See you there. That'll be a whole lot more fun than this right here. Are you interested in being baptized? We have a baptism and discipleship class that's going to be starting in March. You can sign up at the kiosk if you're interested. It's for anybody fourth grade and up.